In Norway, the political community was setting the agenda in global health. We just have to admit that other arenas, including higher education, were a little slower in the uptake. However, thanks to a challenge from Richard Horton and The Lancet, it was an excited academic community at the University of Oslo that responded by convening the Lancet University of Oslo Commission on Global Governance for Health in 2011. It is with great pleasure that I call upon the chair of the commission, rector of University of Oslo, Ole Petter Ottersen, to share with us the key messages of the Lancet University of Oslo Commission on Global Governance for Health. Please, rector. State Secretary, Excellencies, guests, it's such a pleasure to be here on this very, very special occasion. Because what will happen today is that we will launch a report that uh, I hope will pave the way for better solutions to safeguard health worldwide. And uh, as the first slide says, I hope the report will make an imprint on the politics underlying health and that the health of the individual will be central to the uh, global political landscape in the years to come. So first of all, I would uh, say that we are extremely grateful to all those who took the initiative to this particular commission. And many of you are here and you are too many to mention. And we are also very grateful to the commissioners, including uh, the vice chair of the commission, who are here today. And some of these commissioners that have traveled far to uh, witness this uh, event and to take part in the debate. I would like to start with the first point raised by our State Secretary, that the responsibility of health, the responsibility to take care of the health of the population resides with the nation state, with the national government. But one of the key issues that has been addressed in our commission is that many decisions that impact health, that negatively impact health, are taken above the national governments at the supranational level, at the level of global governance. And I think it's fair to say that throughout the two years that our commission has been working on these issues, we have been made aware of the fact that so many decisions taken above the level of the nation state do affect health and that the scale of this problem is immense. And what we hope is that this awareness that slowly was embedded in the commissioners will also be embedded in you who are present here today. And finally also embedded in the uh, decision makers, both at the national level and at the supranational level. So one of the key issues is the simple word awareness. Awareness of the fact that many decisions are taken at the global level, many decisions that negatively impact health. So today, the report was launched, and the first page, the cover page, is shown here. And in fact, the sentence that the editor of Lancet, Richard Horton, chose to display on the cover page says it all. Although, at an overarching level, of course, that health is a precondition, outcome, and indicator of sustainable society and should be adopted as a universal value and a shared social and political object objective for all. What I will come back to later is that when we talk about sustainability, we must not forget social sustainability. Yes, environmental so sustainability is important, Yes, financial sustainability is important, but the consideration of these sustainabilities has to be married 
with a concern for the social sustainability. And I will come back to a landmark commission later on, the one chaired by our guest of honor today, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who provided a report that in fact constitutes an important part of the backdrop of this particular event today. So, as the State Secretary pointed out, great strides have been made over the last years when it comes to health. Yes, life expectancy is increasing by six years globally. And this progress has taken, has, uh, has been seen over the last 24 years or so. And also there is another indicator that demonstrates progress, and that is the annual number of death among children under five. A tremendous progress from 12 million worldwide in 1990 to less than 7 million today. Certainly great strides are being made thanks to the phenomenal investments that are being made in the health sector and thanks to the initiatives that have been taken by many of you who are present here today. And the State Secretary mentioned some of these initiatives. But still we need to realize that we are far from what can be said to be equity when it comes to health. Still today, there is a 21 years difference in life expectancy between the less developed countries and the uh, developed countries that are at the peak of affluence today. 21 years difference in life expectancy. That's a lot. And if you look at other indicators like starvation, like death from diabetes, the situation is far from acceptable. In this particular slide, which I think is very, very important in many ways, the burden of starvation and diabetes is shown in a way when the territories and countries are sized according to the number of deaths. And you will see that some countries not only have severe issues when it comes to starvation, but some of the same countries also have issues and challenges when it comes to diabetes. So we are seeing a sort of paradox here that there is, for many countries, a double burden of malnutrition and obesity slash diabetes. So overweight, starvation go hand in hand in many different countries. And the point we're coming back to is that, yes, nutrition is an issue of choice on the part of the individual, but it also has to do with the market forces, with decisions taken at the supranational level, speculation in uh, food commodities and so forth. This geography that you see here is certainly an indicator of dysfunctions of global governance. More in detail about this. There is a food paradox here in this very world. We do produce enough food, enough food to cover 120% of the global dietary needs. Still, we know that more than 800 million people worldwide are chronically undernourished. Food is not distributed in, an, in a just manner. And I show this picture from the New York Stock Exchange because we know that the global food crisis in 2007-2008 was partly to be explained by speculation in food commodities, by people who were not held accountable for the crisis that followed in the wake of the speculation. Another example where politics at the supranational level influence health in a negative way is what has happened now in uh, Greece with the austerity program. As you all know, Greece had to accept bailout packages from the IMM, IMF, uh, the, the European Central Bank, 
and the European Commission. And as a result of this, the health government's budget was slashed by 40%. We could say that austerity kills, and it certainly did in Greece, and it certainly does in Greece. We know also that infections are on the rise in Greece. We know that the suicide rate is increasing. Yes, indeed, austerity kills. The starting point for this commission that addresses some of the issues that have already been true, political decisions or political decisions at the supranational level, often with economic aims, affect health. The starting point can be summarized in these two bullet points. First of, first of all, the Oslo Ministerial Declaration on Global Health and Foreign Policy from 2007. It was already referred to by the State Secretary. I think this declaration was indeed forward-looking. And it correctly pointed out that health should be a primary outcome of uh, foreign policies. That in order to secure health, was one has to engage beyond the health sector into the realm of foreign policy. And another point figuring prominently in the backdrop of the Commission is exactly what I already mentioned. Bureau Harlem Brundtland's Commission, 1987, on Environment and Development. The word sustainability figures prominently in our report. And as I said, we need to marry the concern for environmental sustainability, financial sustainability, with a concern for social sustainability and health. Now, the Commission consisted of 18 different commissioners. Many of them are present here today, from many different countries and from five different continents. What we started out to do was to look at a very important commission that came out, commission report that came out in 2008, closing the gap in a generation. A commission concerned with the social determinants of health, how the daily living conditions affect health. What we wanted to do was to go beyond that and ask the questions, what are the political determinants that determine the daily living conditions and thus indirectly the health of populations? The difference between two propositions here is extremely important, O and four. We are not looking into the health service system. We are not looking into global governance or health. What we are looking into are the political sectors outside the health sector, which often interfere with the efforts taken by the health sector itself. So we are concerned with the global governance for health. Just an example. Syria was mentioned here now by the State Secretary. Global governance of health is concerned with the vaccination programs. Here there is a child being immunized for polio. What we are concerned with are the political, the political aspects, the political factors that interfere with the global health system and the vaccination programs, for instance. Exemplified here with peace negotiations carried out with John Kerry and his counterpart from, the, from Russia, Sergei Lavrov. It's interesting that the State Secretary mentioned Syria, because here we see the contrast between global governance of health and for health. We know that polio was all, almost or perhaps completely eradicated in Syria in the 1990s. Now it's on its way back. More than 90 cases only since May last year. And we know that we are standing by more or less passively because cross-border aid is not really facilitated by the political landscape. 90 people, at least, infected by polio over the last year or so, and most of them children. That's an example, although a very extreme one, as to how political decisions outside the health sector affect health and the global governance system that's supposed to preserve health. Now, let's go back to this particular room. 
It's interesting that we are discussing the political determinants of health in this room, because this room served temporarily as the parliament in Norway from 1852 to 1866, when the parliament building was completed just on the street. So here was the site where political issues were being discussed, and I presume also political discussions on health. And let's go back, not to 1850s, but to November last year, when Bill Gates was here discussing health with us, an open discussing, a discussion. Let's hear what he said. Real de deaths, uh, pneumonia deaths, uh, malaria deaths, and then a variety of things that happen to a child in the first 30 days, mostly infectious deaths. And so if we get involved in those four areas, uh, we invent the new tools, we get the new t tools delivered, delivered, within a generation, uh, we can have this health equity. Within this generation, we can have this health equity, Bill Gates says. And in this discussion, I think we were very clear that in order to achieve this very ambitious goal, we have to provide Bill Gates and all the other heroes in the, political, in the global health system that are responsible for vertical initiatives and vaccination programs. We have to provide these people with a global political landscape that is supportive and that does not interfere with the efforts within the global health system. That's one of the key issues of the report. In the report, we have gone through several sectors outside of the uh, health arena. We have been looking at financial speculation, we have been looking at investment regimes, we have been looking into transnational companies, how they interact with nations and how they negatively impact health in many nations. We have been looking at irregular migration, we have been looking at intellectual property issues, many different issues in many different sectors that impact on health. And we have some recommendations as to how these sectors could be improved when it comes to decision making. One very important issue, is, uh, one of the very important issues, has to do with uh, intellectual property rights. And there is one agreement that we have been going into in quite some detail, that is the trade-related intellectual, intellectual property rights agreement. And one of our trips to India, we came straight into a court case that uh, bore on this particular issue. And this is a very complex issue because it's a balance between ensuring property rights, but also ensuring affordable medicines to populations, and very often it's a question of providing affordable medicines to the very poor. There is another example here, which I think is very telling, which shows that in many cases, supranational companies are so powerful that an imbalance arises between the power of these companies and the power of nations. In this particular case, for instance, Uruguay tried to protect its citizens by displaying very graphic warning labels on the tobacco packages. But uh, one major tobacco company sued the authorities in Uruguay, saying that you are not allowed to do so. And this case is still not settled. And it shows that above the head of governments, there are powerful forces that sometimes intervene with what the state secretary told us, that it is the responsibility of the nation states to safeguard the health of its populations. Another case from Norway, very complex issue, irregular migration. This is from a place here in Oslo where an irregular migrant was denied access to surgery for a hip fracture. He was treated for AIDS because that's grounded in international law but he was not treated for a hip fracture, showing that there is a political instability here that we have to take care of. 
So what's the common denominator of these different examples, these different cases that are being discussed? And these are just some of the cases that we're looking into. Well, that's why we're here. This, these dysfunctions are not carved in stone. These dysfunctions are the results of a political choice. We can remedy these dysfunctions. We can rectify these dysfunctions. But when, then we need the power of the nation states and the, polit the polit political decision makers in the national states to exert leverage on the supranational institutions that so profoundly affect health. This is the diagnosis. We are saying in the Commission that there are five dysfunctions democratic deficit, weak accountability, institutional stickiness, in the inadequate policy space, missing institutions. All these elements are part of the diagnosis that we have to contemplate. A diagnosis that says that the global governance system is not adequate to protect health in our nation states. Prospects for change, very briefly. We are academics, but I firmly believe that we should also be brave enough to say that we should promote a new norm when it comes to the global governance, that decisions in all political domains should be made with health at the core of thinking. And we hope that we will come to a tipping point when this norm is being embedded in the political landscape at large. We have several suggestions as to how this can be implemented, how this norm can be firmly grounded in the political landscape. And I have no time to go into detail on this, but I do hope that those of you who are present here will support this way of thinking and these initiatives. One thing is to set up a scientific monitoring panel on global social and political determinants of health. One example, such a panel could pick up issues such as, for instance, trade agreements, pick them up proactively bef before they are established and become sticky. For instance, now there is a discussion on a new Trans-Pacific trade agreement, which we now will in fact make it even more difficult for nations to make, to make use of the flexibility embedded in the TRIPS agreement. With, a, with an international monitoring panel, the hope is that one can identify threats to health before, for instance, trade agreements are being set in stone. There is another example here. We propose a multi-stakeholder platform on global governance for health with the legitimacy from the UN that can bring decision makers from all these different political are arenas together so as to discuss issues that relate to health worldwide and to propose changes to the global governance system. And of course, we need to strengthen the use of existing mechanisms for health. For instance, the UN Special Rapporteur. Finally, because time is running out, personally, I would say, that for a university, this work is so important. Because we are supposed to educate the leaders of tomorrow. And those leaders, they will have to take into account that health is much more than a biomedical issue. It's a political issue. And it's an issue that relates to politics at the global governance level. The Youth Commission will present some of their data later. I think that uh, we were brave enough, and I'm glad that we were brave enough, to establish also a Youth Commission working in parallel with ours, because they were so important in pointing out deficits in our way of thinking and suggest new approaches. Key messages, certainly health equity is a cross-sectoral political concern. Many health determinants require transnational responses. The global economic system should serve a global population of healthy people in sustainable societies, obviously. And going back to the first sentence, the overarching message, health is a precondition outcome and indicator of a sustainable society and should be adopted as a universal value and a shared social and political objective for all. Thank you for your attention.